Hello everyone, I am thrilled to be with you today at Change Now. What an honor for me to be here. Let me tell you something, the space I'm about to open here and now is a sacred space because I'm about to welcome on remote and on stage three amazing human beings. And really I want maybe to start, I will ask you to close your eyes. Everybody, you can close your eyes and we'll take three big, beautiful breaths just for ourselves, just to connect to ourselves because we, as you know, are in an environment where there are a lot of people. And it's just good, you know, to close your eyes and connect to yourself. So I invite you to breathe deeply. And a third one. Okay, when you're ready, at your pace, you can open your eyes. Hi again. I'm sure you're more connected to this high now. I am. <laughs> so my very first guest is one of the UK leading resilience trainers. He previously worked for 20 years as an addiction specialist, and he's now advocating for active hope. What I love about active hope is that there, it, there is active, so we get back our power, and we will talk about that with him. Active Hope is actually the title of the book he co-writes with Joanna Macy. Uh, you might have heard of, of Joanna Macy. She's a, a spiritual guide, basically, to make it short. And she um, worked on uh, the work that put us in connection with each other. My guest is now the co-director of Active Hope Training. As, as, and as you can see, he's in remote. You will see in a minute. You will see him on screen but we will still make a beautiful round of applause for Chris Johnston. <laughs> Hello, Chris, how are you feeling today? I'm good, Laura Jane, and really delighted to be joining you. I'm in the north of, north of Scotland, and it's fantastic to see the Eiffel Tower out the window. <laughs> Okay, I, I can't see Chris anymore. Is it possible to put Chris on the screen? That, thank you so much. Perfect. So, Chris, what is exactly Active Hope? Can you tell us about it? Sure. The short answer is Active Hope is being active in support of your hopes. But there's something more there because um, hope is often thought of as something that you have. But with Active Hope, it's something that you do. It's a different way of thinking about hope. It's seeing active hope as a practice for collective well-being. So, for example, people don't have mindfulness or yoga or tai chi. They, they, they do them. And it's similar with active hope. It, you don't so much have active hope, but you do active hope. It's something that you can integrate into your life as a practice for collective well-being. Each day, we can do something where we ask ourselves what we hope for when we look at and consider our world, and then say, how can I be active in support of that? So how do we do it? So in our book, Active Hope, uh, we, um, we've got three steps. So the first step is wherever you are, whatever you face, you start from where you are, and you take in the reality of what you see and also how you feel. So that's step one, start from where you are, take in a view of reality. So if we feel that's really low, it's about acknowledging the fact that we are really low at that moment and certainly not being in denial of that, right? Whatever you face, mm -hmm. you can do active hope even when things are going well. You'd like, you hope that they'll continue to, to go well. But particularly when things are really going badly, when we take, have a turning for the worse, it's very easy for people to lose hope. And that's why, um, if you just see hope as something that you have, when you don't have it, that can become a block to action. People say to me sometimes, they say, well, I don't have any hope of it working, so what's the point? Whereas with active hope, however you feel about your chances of success, you, you start from where you are, you're accepting, you're acknowledging reality as you see it, even if it seems hopeless. But then you say, okay, what do I hope for from here? 
whatever you face, it can always go different ways. And when you say, what do you hope for? You're saying, what's the best that can happen here? What are some of the better ways this can go? But that's the second step. What do I hope for? But the third step is about being active in support of your hope, saying, what can I do to make my hope more likely to happen? What can I do to move that way? When we prepared this call, I said to you, OK, Chris, active hope sounds great, but what about the hopeless people on Earth? What about people that live in great poverty, that you know are exposed to huge violence? Is it even decent to ask them to have hope? And you answered, it is the hopeless that taught me to be hopeful. Can you explain about that? Yeah, so um, actually there's, a there's three different examples I can bring in here. And the first was when I was a medical student, this was about 40 years ago, I spent some time working with a development organization in Sri Lanka. And it was my first experience of witnessing human starvation. And there was an organization there, Sarvodia, who worked with some of the poorest people there. And uh, it was about wherever we are, whatever we face, how can we act together for collective well-being? And so I, I really learned something there. And, and my life really since then has been about how can I take those lessons and apply them where I live now? And then um, I worked for nearly 20 years in the addictions recovery field. Where addicts, yeah. I'd often see people who say, well, I feel hopeless. You know, what's the point of even trying to stop drinking where every time I try, I fail? And um, but but I also saw and I learned from them. There was a time where people it wasn't about whether they were hopeful or not. They were clear what they hoped for and they took steps that way. And. I saw, see active hope as an active energy of engagement that is about expressing our desire for what we'd like to happen. Even if we by don't believe in steps it. To support it. Even if we're, we could say, I'm not sure I'll get there. I'm not sure I'll recover. I'll stop drinking. I, I'll get better, whatever. But I put the intention, and, and if, you know, it might work, but you know what I mean? It's, it's a thin line. Can you explain we're that scene letting, line? We're not letting feelings of hopelessness stop us taking action. Because that's what so often happens in the world. People can look at the sustainable development goals and some people might think, well, I'm not very hopeful that that will happen. In a way, they think, what's the point of even trying? But what we're looking at with Active Hope is really about, we're, we're looking at the psychology of what blocks a response, mm -hmm. but also how do you unblock uh, the engagement that's needed to tackle so many of our world, world problems. And I was really struck by in 2020, I, I was working with a group of mental health professionals in Lebanon, uh, both before and after the explosion in, in Beirut. And um, some of the people in the group um, when she lost practically everything. You know, her flat was destroyed in, in the explosion. And, and she said to me, she said, Chris, there's times here where I run out of hope. You know, my hope is just all dried up. Mm -hmm. But she found the concept of active hope really helpful because wherever you are, whatever you face, you can say, what would it look like if active hope was happening through me now? So what are I the do. three steps? Can you, can you say again those three steps so that we okay. can grab them and go back home with them? Yeah, so wherever you are, whatever you face, you start from where you are. Mm -hmm. you, you start from where you are by taking in the reality of what you see and how you feel. So if you, what you see makes your heart sink, it feels very bleak, as it does when you look at what's happening with climate change in many ways. You say, okay, this is my starting point. But from this starting point, what direction do I hope things will go in? And then how can I be active in making that more lightly? And there's something here about making that more lightly or heading in that direction. You're not the whole story. You, you know, some people say, well, you can't make it happen that things go the way I want. I can't make it happen that we'll reach the sustainable development goals. But I can be part of a larger story. I can play my part in a larger story. And what we look at with Active Hope is, is seeing it as a, a skill 
that we can get better at we can understand more what are some of the blocks to engagement and that we can work together in building support, not just building support, but building in training that mm. helps us deal with the obstacles in the way. So what are the steps of becoming more actively hopeful? Is there, so the third part, how do we do it? Yeah, so I think one of the things is sometimes it's clear it's clear what we need to do. Okay, I hope for this and I need to do that and we just get on with it. But when it's not clear, that sometimes that can be a point that people give up. They say, well, I can't see what to do, so I'll just look the other way or I'll do something else. But what I, I find helpful, there's a term here, the preparation stage of change. If I can't see what to do, then you just add the word yet, where you say, I can't see what to do yet, But I'm going to go on a quest to train myself, to prepare myself. And that's what our book, Active Hope, is about. It's like, how do we train ourselves so that we are better able to respond to our concerns uh, for, for the world? And part of it is a psychological training. It's looking at how do we access our courage? How do we feed our motivation? How do we build a sense of possibility where we might at first feel defeated or feel hopeless or feel overwhelmed, but we learn ways of supporting our capacity to act? What the people that are very much capable of active hope, the people who have the most hope in this world, what does it bring to them? Are they more happy? Are they more capable of love, of, you know, being united to others? What does it bring, basically? So I think when you live a good story, you're, you feel more alive. And there's a term here I, I, I like, um, sustainable happiness. Sustainable happiness doesn't take happiness away from anyone else or a, another point in time. Whereas unsustainable happiness, you can feel good in the moment, But it's like robbing joy from either yourself in the future or other people or other beings. And an example is like someone may drink heavily, feel happy in the evening, but it's like they steal joy from the next day. And if we'd have a high carbon lifestyle, it's like we're stealing joy from future generations or from other parts of the world. And it's understanding that one of the key ingredients for a satisfying life is living a life you have your heart in. So when you engage in active hope, you're living from, you're living a story that you have your heart in. For the people in the room who'd be interested in your training, because after the book you wrote with Joanna Macy, you, you created the active hope training. What is it about and what can they find in it if they want to, to take it? So we have a free video-based online course and there's a website activehope.training and if you just go to activehope.training you can sign up completely free and it takes you on a journey over seven weeks where each week there's a different set of videos that come up there's about an hour or more of videos most weeks and there's also a practice a practice that you can engage in that is about particularly through conversations you know there might be personal practices a conversation with yourself or it might be a conversation with someone else you say hey do you fancy doing this active hope training together and just in a half hour conversation you can have a a a, a, a a conversation that nourishes your enthusiasm to play your part to show up and play your part and um It's based on uh, the, the work that Joanna Macy, particularly in America, who's 93 now, an incredible um, inspiration for me, um, that she developed and has been using for over 40 years. But we've also done a, a survey of people, over 100 people who've done this training, completed it. And it, they, the survey showed that they found the training strengthened their motivation to act for change. It also strengthened their belief that they could make a difference. It also helped them feel less overwhelmed when facing world problems and also nourished by the experience too. Chris, my last question is, is the following. Uh, do you think we can change the world if we don't start by changing ourselves? I think it goes hand in hand. That when you look out the world, you may have a sense of 
um, both delight at what's amazing that you want to protect and stand up for, but also horror and anguish about all the things that are going wrong that you would hope to change. So um, it's seeing out there what needs to happen, but also there's an inner side of change, which is, do I believe I can make any difference? Do I, am I motivated? Um, have I got a sense of vision? And so I think they go hand in hand. And the work that I've been involved in really for about 40 years now is really looking at that, that piece of change between awareness of a problem and action to change it. I call it the middle bit of change. How do we um, actively engage in practices and apply insult, in, apply insights that help us really bring out our best, that help us rise to the occasion that's needed in these times. Thank you so much, Chris Johnston. Ladies and gentlemen, please make a round of applause for Chris Johnston. Thank you, Chris. Thank you for being with us. I am now going to welcome two other amazing people. Um, for quite a few years now, we've been hearing about the fact that we are shifting paradigms. We all know that we, can, we cannot go on like this. We cannot continue to act like if we had a planet B, because obviously there is no planet B. We all know it. The challenge is huge. We need to change radically and as soon as possible, or there will be dramatic consequences. Again, you're not uh, learning anything right now. We all know it. We need to change everything, individuals, governments, industries. So we basically need what we call a systemic change, a change of the entire system. I have the greatest pleasure to welcome two incredible human beings to talk about it. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome very warmly Satish Kumar and Nora Wilhelm. <laughs> <laughs> you sit here, Satish. Yes. Is that okay? You have water. Do you want some water? <laughs> okay. So while I introduce you, you can have some water. So Satish, it's simply impossible to sum up your life. I mean, I've interviewed you for an hour and a half, and we could have gone out, gone for 18 more hours minimum. But I'll I'll try to give the big highlights. Okay. So you started your life as a giant monk. Before you read, so Jain Monk uh, in India, right? Uh, before you read Gandhi, so you were a Jain Monk before you read Gandhi, we all know about Gandhi, right? And decided then to run away because you weren't changing the world enough. Fair enough. You then did a walk of peace from New Delhi to Washington, D.C. Later on in your life, again, I'm going really fast forward because you're 85 years old, so, and we only have 35 minutes. Um, but then uh, you settled in the UK where you created the Schumacher College, a school where we learn about holistic ecology, and I know a few people have been there in this room. Uh, so it's a beautiful place if you ha have the chance to go one day. There's Marie who went, yes. <laughs> okay, so you're an activist, you're an author. Uh, you actually have three books in French for French people in the room and many more in English. Uh, you're an editor, a teacher, and more than anything, your spiritual guide. So thank you for being here today, Satish. It's an honor. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. <laughs> Nora. Uh, you are a social entrepreneur from Switzerland and innovator. You co-founded Collaboratio Helvetica in 2017, which aims towards systemic change, that's perfect, we're going to talk about it, by cultivating a cross-sectoral innovation ecosystem. You've been a change maker since very young, and among other things, you presided the European Youth Parliament in Switzerland and worked closely with UNESCO, right? You were a UNESCO young leader, am I saying it right? And you are exactly. Forbes 30 under 30 leader. That's it, no pressure. Okay, so thank you, Nora, for being here. Uh, my first question can seem easy, but I don't think it's that easy. What does it mean to shift paradigms? No, uh, Satish, please start. Thank you. And it's a pleasure to share platform with Nora. And I was just saying that this is a very wonderful occasion because it's intergenerational, intercultural, intergender. And so it's wonderful to have, this is a new paradigm. This is a new paradigm yes. to bring these two together. Before I say what is new paradigm, I want to say 
what is old paradigm? <laughs> the old paradigm is, and I mean, there are many things you can say, but briefly, we have in this old paradigm thought that nature and humans are separate. Nature's out there, the trees, the mountains, the Seine River, the animals and the birds and everything. And we humans are separate. This is old paradigm. And so we, because we are separate, then we say we are better than nature. We are above nature. We are superior to nature. And then we say we can exploit nature. We can conquer nature. We can do what we like to nature. Nature is only a resource for the economy. This is old paradigm. Now, new paradigm, shifting that paradigm to new paradigm is we are not separate from nature. We are as much nature as the animals and the birds and the trees and the mountains and the Seine River and the oceans. Because we are made of the same elements, earth, air, fire, water, space, time, consciousness. And nature is conscious, and nature is alive. The old paradigm said that nature is a machine, and earth is a dead rock. The new paradigm says nature is a living organism. Nature is not machine, nature is not dead, it's not inanimate. Nature is a living organism. And the earth is not a dead rock. Earth is also a living organism. So I think this is a new paradigm. If we want to change our economy, our politics, our industry, our business, we have to change this world view that nature is there only as a resource for the economy. And actually, old paradigm also says that humans are also a resource for the economy. You know, in, 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 uh, in businesses, you have an HR department. I don't know if you have in, in France, but in England, we have an HR department. HR means human resources. I always say, HR does not stand for human resources. HR stands for human relationship. So this is a new paradigm. Change using nature and humans as a resource for production, consumption, profit, economy, money, uh, running organizations, to organizations, profit, money, consumption, uh, production are the means and the nature and humans are the end. And so we have to have that dignity of nature and humans. That's a new paradigm, in brief. But if I follow what you're saying, Satish, I feel like we used to be so much more connected to nature. So industrialization, for instance, it's what destroyed everything. You know what I mean? Like probably in the 15th, 16th century, we were feeling as a human being part of nature and we lost it along the way. Do you agree with that? Yes, yes, we are, yeah, yes. We are part of nature because we are nature. And the thing is that when we say we are nature, then we, what we do to nature, we do to ourselves. If we pollute the water, we have to drink it. If we pollute the air, we have to breathe it. If we pollute the atmosphere and create global warming, we have to live with it. So what we do to nature, we do to ourselves. So this unity of life, this is a new paradigm. Nora. Yeah, I completely agree with everything that uh, Satish has just said, and maybe to add from my point of view with the uh, the three divides that is known in the realm of theory U and others, there's definitely this ecological divide where we see ourselves as separate from nature. And additionally to that, also this old paradigm of seeing ourselves as separate from each other, right? As separating humans based on all sorts of different criteria and using that as grounds for discrimination, um, often as a divide and conquer type of strategy, justifying conflict, justifying exploitation, and the fact that other people live in sometimes in terrible conditions, sometimes at the hand of the, the very other people that are aware of it. Um, and just in general, this yeah, separation between human beings. I think for me, that's the second big divide that, that we are facing. And new paradigm is also that you are not separate from me. Just as I am not separate from nature, I am also not separate from the person next to me. And what I do to another by purchasing a shirt, for example, that was made in polluting rivers, um, in uh, situations that were very harmful for the peop people that were working in those conditions, that is also something that I am doing to myself. And I have a responsibility in how I treat uh, nature and also other people. 
And the third one, which I think for me also comes directly from uh, this old paradigm that, uh, that you were describing, Satish, is the separation from oneself. Mm -hmm. Because of course, if I don't see myself as part of nature, if I don't see myself as part of a global humanity, a civilization, a society, or any type of community, um, then how am I in touch with myself? How do I know who I am and where I'm situated, why I'm here? And of course, in a, in a capitalistic world, it's much easier to exploit people, it's much easier to sell them things that they don't need if they don't know who they are, nor why they're here, nor what makes them happy, right? Mm. So for me, this is what constitutes really this, this paradigm that we are uncovering layers and layers and layers of trauma and, and heaviness of, that we sometimes still live in, uh, of being divided from nature, divided from each other, divided from ourselves, and growing into hopefully more and more a new paradigm, which is based on this, uh, this connection, overcoming this uh, very often artificial sense of separation that was instilled in us. So what do you, the both of you, what do you do to work on that and to help sh uh, the, the, the paradigm shift basically? Nora, please. Okay. Yeah. Um, so my background, uh, as you said previously, was in, in youth activism. So of course being 15, 16 years old and awakening to the state of the world and after overcoming the shock, the sadness, the frustration, uh, anger at my parents and everyone uh, for, for what I then discovered was the reality of things besides my idyllic little bubble in, in Switzerland of being a privileged person growing up in such a privileged country, very similar to France. Um, I then started to get engaged with other young people. It's the likely thing to do, right? Motivating other, other young people to also get engaged and that our voices are important and that we can make a contribution. But, but and where, where was it coming from? Just your awakening on the world. Yeah, I can't really explain it. I think I was so in shock at, at seeing uh, certain things that were happening and my direct contribution to it. So I think I somehow innately had this sense that <coughs> the things I was witnessing is not separate from me. There mm. is not a, a big bad guy somewhere that is doing deforestation in the Amazon and is operating slaughterhouses and so on. Mm. Uh, this is a big system that I am as much a part of as anyone else. Even I may not be the decision maker, I may not have completely created it, but by buying into it um, and not working on changing it, I am supporting it all the mm. same. So I think that was my my kind of view on it. Mm. Sorry, um, I, I stopped yourself. No, 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 so it's all good. What do you do to work on Yeah, it? So, so I was focusing on not on like bringing more diversity into these big institutions. I was focused on we need more uh, women and non-binary people and we need more people from different cultures and backgrounds and we need more young voices in politics. Mm -hmm. And eventually, around 2017, I just noticed that the system itself is broken that even if we bring more diversity into all the current places of decision making, this does not necessarily fix the situation because it is still built on a fundamental paradigm and a fundamental set of values that continues to extract, right, and to drive profit and so on. So, so what do we do when we... So what do we yeah. do, exactly. Yeah. So for, since then, I think we've asked ourselves this huge question around systems change. And I really want to emphasize that I don't think there are answers. Uh, like I've, I've witnessed a few uh, sessions before where uh, people get on the stage and say, I found a solution. I founded this company. We're going to change the world. And for me, this is an example, a bit of the old paradigm, right? Of this mindset of, I have it figured out. Watch me. Look at me. Solve the situation. And as soon, I think, as we start to look at systems change and the complexity and the independence, interdependence, sorry, between everything, there is nothing we can do but be very humble about our relationship to systems, our knowledge of it, our understanding of it, and taking it one step at a time. So what we've been doing for the last five years, I consider a little bit more of a research project than standing here and proclaiming you I have, have all the solution. answers. Mm. So basically what we do in Switzerland at Collaborat Selvetica is that we notice that uh, there are many people striving for change, but they are very often not connected or they are even competing, even though they have the same goal, right? Because we are in this paradigm of competition, so that's one thing we wanted to change. So we tried to make work visible across all language regions, across all sectors, across different topics, and we tried to connect them so that they may understand what they do, hopefully collaborate and achieve greater impact. And then the other dimension is that we thought that we definitely need more collaboration, but specifically cross-sector collaboration in order to meet the challenges that we are facing. We are not believers in technology will save us all. Uh, or this one next startup is going to save the day. 
Uh, we think that it's, it is going to be a slow path. It's going to be a human change focused path. Technology is important and I don't take that away from anyone. Um, but we need this dimension of cross-sector collaboration in order to move forward. So we focused on an innovation ecosystem and social innovation labs uh, as a specific tool to try to engage both change makers, the marginalized voices, into reimagining systems and driving the solutions together. Satish, what do you do among many um, things I to work agree on system with change? Nora that um, no one of us, I or anyone else, can do anything on our own. All our actions have to be co-creative. We work together. So, um, so, as you said, I did it, <laughs> not that, because when we say like I did it, that's a kind of separation again. It's a co-creation. We move from ego to eco. From ego to eco. Eco. Yeah. Eco means together. Eco means home, family, working together. So with other people, what I have sort of been involved in and, and working with is Schumacher College to create new paradigm. Because the educational system we have today is education of old paradigm. Mm -hmm. It's teaching Cartesian dualism. It's teaching, again, that, that um, mm -hmm. nature and humans are a resource. And if you go to education, uh, um, university, schools, they will look at you and they will look at students and they say, students have no body, only brain. No hands, no heart, no legs, just brain. And only half brain <laughs> because we have a two hemisphere of the brain, left hemisphere and right hemisphere. The left hemisphere is more reason, mathematics, pragmatism, uh, practicalities, and science and all that. The right brain is more intuition, creativity, imagination, spirituality, relationship. So all our universities are teaching just left hemisphere of the brain and nobody. So at Schumacher College, we created this new paradigm education where it's a nature-centered, it's the human-centered, the earth-centered, and the whole person-centered. So we have education of head, education of hearts, and education of hands. I would say that is the education of new paradigm. And if we can bring that, I mean, that's a, the work I have been involved at Schumacher College, and some of you have been to Schumacher College, so you know what we are doing. We are saying nature is our teacher. We have to learn from nature. Uh, one of our teachers was uh, Janine Benius, who wrote a book called Biomimicry. Learn from nature, mimic from nature. So if we can create a new education, which is earth-centered, earth-centered, nature-centered, human-centered, heart-centered, soul-centered, spirit-centered, consciousness-centered, rather than just job-centered and money-centered and success-centered, then I think we can create a new paradigm. When do you become the Minister of Education of the World again? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. When no, I, I, I was making a joke and, and asking, yeah. when are you becoming the Minister of Education of the entire world with the <laughs> Schumacher? <laughs> we need that. <laughs> Nora, do you want to add anything? Uh, no, just uh, our dogs welcome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Our, dogs, <laughs> our dogs are welcome exactly. to the Schumacher. Yeah. Of course. Okay. Yeah. Amazing. Then I'll, I'll sign up. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, what are the key ingredients and stakeholders, all of the stakeholders, in bringing, bringing system change? Bringing? System change. S changing the system. Changing the system? Yes. Changing the system. Um, first of all, I have said already, the change does not start from the center. Change, real change of new paradigm is not going to begin in Palais Elysee. <laughs> whoever the president, <laughs> never mind, or White House, or the Kremlin, or any other center, or the business center. It has to come from the grassroots level, at the bottom. And as I said in my previous session, the river Seine going through Paris, where did it start? It started somewhere in the mountains, somewhere in the hills, a small spring. So the same way, whatever, we are doing, whoever you are, we are, 
wherever we are, we have to be that source of change. And then tributaries come and join the river. And then it becomes a great river. So the great movements start small, start on the fringe, start on the margin, and they become revolutionary. And they become transformative. And so do not underestimate the power of each and every one of us taking action. Do not undervalue your power, my power, our power at the grassroots level. We can sow the seeds of transformation and change wherever we are. So let's start with ourselves. Be the change that we want to see in the world. Communicate that change in the world. Organize the change in the world ourselves. We have to do it. Leadership is not going to come from Pali Elise. But thank you. You can applaud. <laughs> Yeah, I totally agree, and yet I feel a lot of people in the world is asleep. Yeah. So how do we wake them up? How do you it? How there is no way to do it. Doing is the way. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way. How do you learn to play violin? By playing violin. How do you learn gardening? By doing gardening. So, new paradigm or new transformation is not a theory. It's not just an <laughs> academic idea. It's a reality. It has to be done. We have to just do it every day. So when you wake up in the morning, I would advise, just start to say, it, ask yourself, who am I? What is the meaning of my life? Why am I here? What can I, can I do and will, will I do today to contribute to bring about new paradigm on this earth? What am I going to do? Not what somebody else is going to do. Not what uh, presidents and prime ministers and CEOs of the world will do. But what am I going to do? Start with yourself. And then c learn to communicate your ideas. I mean, through music, through painting, through dancing, through gardening, through cooking, through speaking, through writing books. Mm. Uh, my publisher is here. He he's looking for some wonderful new books. Communicate your ideas, because <laughs> at the mo moment, the business world is communicating very powerfully with advertising and social media and so on. And our change now is wonderful, and it's a very great uh, event, and I congratulate the organizers uh, to do it. But we need such communication more powerfully, so that everybody is aware of new paradigm. What is new paradigm? How are you going to bring it? We need to communicate, and then we need to organize like this change now is organizing, we have to organize. And this way, have a hope, like uh, Chris talked about, have hope, have faith, have a trust, and keep going. That's all you can do. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had you. <laughs> what did you say, Nora? I wish I had you when I was younger, as when I needed a pep talk of, of yeah. motivation and inspiration. Yeah. <laughs> I completely agree also with, uh, with everything that was already said. Uh, from my point of view, in systems change, and as one system is dying and ending, and the institutions that are part of it and that embody it are dying and ending, and a new one is being born, there are different contributions. And I think what you spoke to, a lot of it is that there are people who are focused on birthing the new. They're focused on creating the alternatives. They may move to an eco-village. They may found a new type of school, right? They are focused on creating the new. There are other people who are focused on helping the old system die. Mm -hmm. And this is also valuable work. It is maybe less easy to communicate. Maybe it's sadder, whatever. But some people are trying to help all those industries that will not make it and that need to change so profoundly that actually they might just end. So this death work of the old system is also a contribution. And there's a third one, uh, which is what I'm engaged in, which is in the middle. So how can you link those two together? And how can you try to both work with the actors of the new, with the stakeholders and the powerful decision makers of the old, in a way, to change what we can in that middle space? And that is a difficult work, because you're always navigating these different logics and these different priorities. Um, but for me, in the current context, uh, knowing that the power is concentrated in certain places, that there, there are people who could decide for a system like the education system to change in a whole country today or tomorrow. In most cases, this is possible or in a very large multinational and so on. But they are not choosing that. And there are, there are many reasons why they're not doing it. And I'm not saying it is because they are bad people necessarily. 
but we know that resistance to change correlates with how invested you are in the status quo. So of mm. course, if you've made your entire lifetime, built your entire career, right, working yourself up to the top of a pyramid of any sorts, it's very hard to hear from either younger generations or people coming from a different viewpoint or a new theory, a new worldview, telling you that you've done wrong or that you need to change. Um, and it may be such a big identity shift that people become very resistant, right? And so this is where we work, like in that space of um, convening also those people who are resistant to change, together with the change makers who are creating the new. And actually in those interactions, real magic happens. In those interactions of people who would not normally talk or meet, many times they're actually opposed to meeting, right? We're talking, um, uh, for example, a laboratory that happened in Brazil on food with uh, high executives from Pepsi and Coca-Cola and activists who are calling out everything that Pepsi and Coca-Cola is doing in terms of poor nutrition and health in Brazil. And both sides refused to be in the same room. So it's really, really hard work to mm. actually get people to be in the same room, listen to each other, talk to each other. But when they do, it can be deeply, deeply transformative. We were talking about that when preparing uh, this panel, about the intergenerational uh, conversation that is harder and harder, and there is a polarization of the debate with uh, the older who feel attacked and the younger who are called the, the, the woke generation, the woke washing and stuff. How do, we, you, you, how do we make people talk to each other? Because again, we are changed now, and I'm pretty sure everyone here knows about you know, all of the problems we're facing. But again, there's a lot of denial about ecology, racism, about domination of, um, from men over women. So how you know, uh, do we deal with that day to day? For me, the first step is... Uh, and um, outside of change now, obviously. Yeah, for me, the first step is uh, compassion or empathy with oneself and with the other, because we were all conditioned in the current system. So we all have um, heteronormativity and white supremacy and gender constructs and mm. so on and so forth programmed into us. And this was not of our choosing. Um, and it takes years and years of practice and of conscious unlearning and reprogramming yourself or retuning yourself to different values. Um, so having a sense of humility and compassion towards oneself and each other as we recognize this, I think for me is the first step. And then in understanding that many people grew up in this, um, in this deep sense of separation and of not belonging. And so the mechanism is very often defense, right? Mm. Oh, you say something different from me, therefore I must defend myself. I must defend my viewpoint. You're different, uh, you speak in another way, so I must defend my own. And these types of dynamics um, in our work, we try to shift them again with a tool based on theory U with the levels of listening and levels of dialogue. So for example, we, we used to host uh, dialogue evenings on, on difficult topics such as gender diversity and, and equity. Um, and in one specific example, a person who was a cisgendered uh, man came into the conversation and in the opening circle stated, there is no such thing as sexism, there is no such thing as gender inequity, I don't even know why we're having this conversation. And of course, a bunch of women who were educated, anyone who was educated on this topic immediately triggered, right? But before we could get into a debate and into, I disagree with you, you are wrong, here's my list of 10 facts, right, that I learned in my good university, you are wrong, here's the book on why you're wrong which is very often what we tend to, to revert to, we actually went on what's called a dialogue walk. And it means that for just 10 minutes, you will speak, I will listen. I will not say a word, I will not ask questions, I will only listen. And then we shift. I will speak and you will listen for 10 minutes. And the question was, when was the first time that you realized that gender plays a role in your life? And this person proceeded to tell me the story of how at a very young age in primary school, there was a girl who was bullying him, who was abusing him, who was really harassing him, and he was not getting any help from anyone. And he ended up hitting this young girl. And he was punished because boys should not hit girls. And it was that formative experience at that young age that had him so deeply convinced that there is in fact injustice against men all the time, and women, quote unquote, are the privileged ones, right? And in being just heard, and listened to and received in that moment, unleashed something in him that by the end, he left saying, this was a very interesting evening. I learned some new things tonight. And I do see how some people also experience different realities and discrimination. 
And it was this act of being received and listened to and not immediately argued back, right, with facts yeah, yeah. that allowed the transformation. So for me, this is the mechanism that we're talking about, listening to Deep each other. Listening. Exactly, to the point where it's transformative. No, I totally agree with what uh, Nora has said. <laughs> well, wonderful, wonderful. Uh, <clears throat> you know, the universe and the evolution favors diversity. And sex, race, gender, anything, nationalism, <coughs> all these things are to be celebrated. The diversity should be celebrated. Because in the beginning of the time, Big Bang, there were no races, there were no genders, there were no nationalities, there were no Hindus, Muslims, Christians, there were no um, black, white. But we, evolution had worked hard for billions of years to create this wonderful diversity. Biodiversity, cultural diversity, gender diversity, race diversity, religious diversity, truth diversity. So let us celebrate diversity. It is good to have many languages. If everybody spoke French in the world, <laughs> That would not, that would be boring. Yes. <laughs> if everybody spoke English in the world, that would be boring. It's wonderful to have many languages in the same way. So all this idea of um, divisions and conflicts and, and one race above other race and therefore suppress other race, that is all a kind of conditioning of our mind. So we have to expand our consciousness, expand our mind, embrace the diversity of every kind, the eight billion people on this planet Earth. There are eight billion diversities. Every one of us are different. Let's celebrate that diversity and not turn diversity into divisions and not turn uh, unity into uniformity. This is our challenge of time. And when we are able to celebrate diversity, then all these kind of conflicts that we have today in the name of whatever uh, uh, you have, they will diminish. And, and we will be able to enjoy. I mean, in nature, everything is there. The thorns are there, the flowers are there, the trees are there, the birds are there, the snakes are there, the insects are there, the earthworms are there. Everything has a place. Celebrate. So I would like to celebrate diversity rather than turn into divisions. Amen. Okay, I'd like, we only, I have a few minutes left. Unfortunately, I'd love to stay on stage with you, but I can't. So my last question is, are you still hopeful? We were talking about active hope in front of the unwiseness of humanity and the huge emergency. Are you still hopeful that we will manage to shift on time? Nora. Hmm. I have to be. I have to be because otherwise, why, why go on, right? Yeah. Why live? Why do anything at all? So for me, I very much agree with what was said at the beginning around active hope and choosing to, to be hopeful, choosing to strive, choosing to uh, believe we can take one step at a time, even if it looks bleak. And I do want to acknowledge that even though an individual can do a lot, and there's a lot of space where actually a paradigm shift starts within ourselves, and it takes definitely a lot of inner work, there is this systemic inequity, right? There is the systemic pressure that exists all around us. And it's also, in some cases, specifically used as a tool for manipulation to place the responsibility on the level of the individual. Just one very concrete example, inviting, like, invention of recycling by big um, beverage companies who wanted to make it much more profitable and felt like, oh, customers may feel bad if they throw something out, so we're going to invent recycling so they feel better about themselves, right? So we push people to recycle, but actually it was a specific invention, cutting costs and increasing profit and making the whole environmental result worse on the sides of the company. So there are cases in which it's important to acknowledge that they are, again, decision makers and there is a system uh, that is skewed. And putting that whole pressure on ourselves, it can feel like we carry the weight of the world and it can be a recipe for burnout. Um, so just also there, I don't have the answers. I am a candidate myself of poor mental health and whatnot, which is so typical in change makers. But just to really honor that, yes, you can do a lot within yourself. You can choose to be hopeful. You can have that inner paradigm shift uh, work going on and on and on. And it's important to engage in sufficient self-care, in sufficient 
boundaries, community care, have people around you who support you and so on, uh, so that you're not constantly exposed to this systemic injustice and exploitation that is just all around us. So I think that would be my, my takeaway. So yes, work on systems change, go out there, spread the word, be hopeful, engage in storytelling, collaborate with others, and don't forget to care in all of that also for yourselves and the people closest to you. Absolutely. Yes, I agree, I agree. Um, if there is no hope, then why bother doing anything? You act only because you have some hope. But hope is not passive, as Chris said. Mm -hmm. um, if you see the light at the end of the tunnel, you don't wait that to come to you. You have to walk to it. So you have a hope, but you have action. And and action, hope is not expectation. Act without expectation of results or outcome. Action in it itself has its intrinsic value. So hope is absolutely necessary, but without desire, without expectation that I will achieve this or I will achieve that and I'll be successful. Whether you are successful or not, whether you achieve or not, you act hoping that if not in my life, in next generation's life, there will be some transformation. I had a great privilege and honor of meeting Martin Luther King in 1964. Actually, I heard Martin Luther King's speech. I have a dream, and hope is a dream is similar. When I was in Paris in August 1964, and when I heard the speech, I said, well, this is the great message of hope. I have a dream. And when I arrived in America, I wrote to him and said, you have a big dream, I have a small dream, and my dream is to meet you. <laughs> and he said, yes, come. He wrote to me back and come. It'll be pleased to, I will be pleased to see you. Anyway, I went to see him. He was an embodiment of hope, a radical man. So, at that time, Martin Luther King had hope, but did not know that one day a black man would be in the White House. Mm. Uh, and he died without seeing a black man in the White House. But after 40 years, 50 years, Obama was in the White House. So things changed, not maybe necessarily in your own lifetime. So you act not just for yourself. I mean, our past generations have built so much culture, language, religion, philosophy, science, uh, architecture, gardens, all these, that Eiffel Tower, all these things were built by our ancestors. We have to have hope and act for our future generations. So we build, we create, we write books, we write poetry, we create the Eiffel, new Eiffel Tower, so we create ecological society for future generations. So don't expect things to happen to me, today, tomorrow, in my lifetime. Just act and build, not only for yourself, but future generations. That's the hope. Thank you, Satish, and thank you, Nora. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you to have uh, followed us, and that's the end of that session, I guess. Thank, <laughs> thank you. you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.